Welcome back. I'm excited to be able to jump into the text today, but before I do that, I want to focus for a few moments on the role of Scripture in our spiritual formation. Obviously, it must be pretty important because it's God's Word, but it's not the exclusive means that God uses to shape our lives. In fact, I would even go so far as to say it's not the prominent or even the um, the paramount means that God uses to shape our lives. I think there are lots of different ways that God shapes us spiritually. One of those is conversations. I've had so many wonderful God-centered conversations with people over the years, and I know that some of those conversations have influenced me even up into this juncture of my life. Another thing that might not really be applicable to you, but is for me uh, is certainly watching movies. And I know that sounds like a great uh, excuse, a great justification for watching movies. Uh, but whenever I, I watch any kind of movie, I try to look at it through a certain lens and I try to really think about it. I mean, I try to enjoy it, but I try to, to uh, contemplate the meaning that might be conveyed in, in the movie. And I tried to really ask myself the questions that are being prompted in the narrative. And I, uh, I ask how I can be changed, how I can become a better person, how I can be motivated, how I can be inspired. And so maybe it's because I'm a part of a generation that really embraces media. But movies are really um, spiritually formative for me. But what about the Bible? I mean, for the most part, the Bible was really written and meant to be read in, for groups of people. And while I think that it's important for us to have personal devotional lives, I think it can be more than just um, unbeneficial, if that's a word. But I think it can be more than that. I think it can be dangerous if that's all we do. If all we do is read the Bible by ourselves and we never participate in a, in a larger group because it, it was really meant for us to read together as a community. But, on, on the other hand, even as we hear and read and study the Bible together in a group, we can't always make group decisions. Sure, we can say, yeah, we need to, we need to have a campaign to revive this sector of our church. Uh, we can read a passage and say, you know, this is really speaking to all of us and this is a change that we need to make in our church. But at the same time, there are going to be other passages of Scripture that are kind of permeating um, into the hearts and minds of individuals that are not really penetrating into the minds of others. And so we have to um, respond to it accordingly. We have to begin to allow different passages at different times in our life to shape us. And so... I've been thinking about that. What does it mean for me to have tangible, um, evidential shaping in my life from the scripture? If that didn't make sense, let me rephrase it. How do people look at my life and say, what is different about him? How do people look at my life and see holiness and love and compassion and uh, a drive to serve how do people see humility um, and that's not a question of uh, that it's there and it's easy to see but it's more of a question of do they see it where do they see it how is it at work and that's a pretty convicting kind of question to ask it's basic it's simple, it's something that pretty much any believer of any uh, place in their journey can ask. But it's convicting for me. What are the, t the tangible elements in my life? What is the tangible evidence in the decisions that I make that I am uh, shaped by the scripture? And uh, really it comes down to being a question about our own identity. What kind of person are we? What are we identified with? And that's really what our text is about today. We know that Paul has been arguing up to this point 
that the Gentile believers have been saved by the same grace as the Jewish believers and vice versa. And that Paul wants them to identify themselves with God's covenant people and to live out the same kind of holiness. And so he reminds them how they've been saved in verses uh, 8, 9, and 10 of Ephesians chapter 2. You've been saved by grace through faith, not of yourselves, so that no one can boast. It is a gift of God. And verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So he reminds them why God's grace is given to us and how it's supposed to shape us and change us. But at the end of chapter 2, starting in verse 19, he begins with how it is supposed to change us in a uh, way that we're identified by other people. And I see, starting in verse 19, kind of the beginning of the effect. Um, maybe the the first portion of this letter is, is all argument, and it's about the cause, because God has done all of this. And now we're getting to the effect, the effect, cause and effect. And so in verse 19 of chapter 2, Paul says, So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, writing to a group of Gentile believers. And this is um, the terminology used by Jewish people to identify Gentiles, strangers and aliens. You're no longer strangers and aliens, but you are a you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. So this is all Jewish language. You're part of God's family is essentially what Paul is saying. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, which would be new, it wouldn't really necessarily be um, a Jewish element, apostles and prophets, although Jewish people obviously had prophets, but the apostles, the apostleship was kind of a new phenomenon. So this is the church that he's referring to, apostles and prophets, um, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. In him, or I'm sorry, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. So, Paul is talking to these Gentile believers about how they're being identified, no longer as strangers and aliens, but as the people of God. And I find it very interesting that he uh, identifies them or encourages them or maybe pays them a compliment by calling them a building. You are a building. Your foundation is the apostles and prophets and the cornerstone is Christ Jesus. And then he says that we are built, being built into a temple. Now this is incredibly significant because um, the word that Paul uses here for temple is the Greek word naos. And in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, we call that the Septuagint or the LXX. In the Greek version of the Old Testament, the Holy of Holies is called the Naos. Now in the temple, there were several different layers, several different rooms that you could go into. But there was a room that only the high priest could go into. And in that room, there was a mercy seat. And that's where the priests would apply the, uh, the sacrifice on what was called Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And upon putting the sacrifice upon the altar, God would forgive his people and that would be an atonement for their sins. And the high priest would experience and witness the Shekinah glory of God. And so... Paul is saying to these Gentile believers, you are this space, you are this place, you are the place where the Shekinah glory of God dwells. And what does he say at the end of this chapter in verse 22, in whom you also are being built into a dwelling of God in the spirit. So they are this holy sacred place that only the high priest is allowed to go and the Spirit of God, which 
I think could represent the Shekinah glory of God dwells. And so the identity of these believers, the tangible evidence within their lives that they are transformed and changed is the spirit. It's not that we're zapped and that we become totally different people automatically. But what changes is that we have a person who indwells us, a person who comes to live within us. It's not that I am automatically just this perfect person and everything in my life is turned upside down and everyone can see that. Obviously, some pretty immediate changes begin to take place in the lives of some people who have lived um, kind of maybe a, a rough life. But the idea here is that their identity is something that is going to continue to change. Their identity is going to be perfected. Their identity is going to be uh, shaped. No longer strangers and aliens, they are the holy place where God's spirit continues to shape and to change them. And so the evidence within their life is what Paul talks about in Galatians, the fruit of the spirit, love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control, faithfulness. And um, when the spirit comes and, and dwells within our life, then our identity changes and we become a different kind of people. And that's when people begin to look at us and say, where is that humility coming from? That is so counterintuitive to our culture. I mean, we're a culture of dog-eat-dog dog kind of people where we've got to fight for what we want and we have to stand up and voice our opinions. But Jesus says in Philippians, or Paul says in Philippians chapter 2 that if we want to have the same mind as Christ, we have to humble ourselves as servants. We have to be humble. Not a prominent theme of 21st century North American culture. So we begin to be shaped by this person who lives within us. And these tangible things begin to take place. We begin to become servants. We become people who are so grateful. So grateful for what God has done for us. And so in our gratefulness we become generous to others. While there's generosity that exists outside of the body of Christ, it is a rare commodity. And so people begin to see that as an evidence in our life of our identity, that we are a part of God's people. And so as we look at the Bible, you know, for me, I love to read it, I love to study it, I like to look at the, the socio-historical implications, and a lot of times that pours over into the meaning of the text and how that shapes the way that I think and that sort of thing. But how often do I just allow the text to press me down and say, hey, how is your life different? And I think that's what Paul is saying now. You've been grafted into the family of God. How do people know that? How is that evident and while the implied answer is the Holy Spirit I think we can take it one step further and ask how is the Spirit manifesting itself as the Shekinah glory how is God being glorified in our lives is it because we humble ourselves submit ourselves completely to God and allow him to live completely through us how do we do that Maybe that's a question for conversation, a question for contemplation and discussion. I'm glad we got to share in this time together this week. I hope you have a blessed time. I hope that you are shaped and changed by the words of God. I hope that your life is impacted and I hope that um, we won't be able to leave the same, that our life will constantly be shaped by the person who lives within us, the Spirit of God, manifests himself in a beautiful way and causes us to take on a new identity. Until next time, grace and peace be with you.